Okay, today is Ether chapter 9. And now I, Moroni, proceed with my record. Therefore, behold, it came to pass that because of the secret combinations of Achish and his friends, behold, they did overthrow the kingdom of Omer. Nevertheless, the Lord was merciful unto Omer, and also unto his sons and to his daughters who did not seek his destruction. And the Lord warned Omer in a dream that he should depart out of the land. Wherefore, Omer departed out of the land with his family, and traveled many days, and came over and passed by the hill of Shim, and came over by the place where the Nephites were destroyed, and from thence eastward, and came to a place which was called Ablam, by the seashore, and there he pitched his tent, and also his sons and his daughters and all his household, save it were Jared and his family. Moroni now continues with the, with the record after kind of going on the, on the soapbox a little bit to talk about why secret combinations were a bad thing. That's why he says, now I proceed with the, with the record. In other words, back to the story. And so it says, but because of the, the plot of Achish and his friends, it, it says they were successful in overthrowing the kingdom of Omer, and so, which was their, their plan all along. But part of their plan was not successful because uh, Omer escaped, Omer left with his family and was not killed. Right? And, um, and this is an example of somebody who was a servant of God, that God was merciful to him, right? That, uh, basically saying, you, you don't need to be king, but I'm going to save your life and save your family, because these other people were not uh, good people, they're going to come in and, and kill you. So, as you see there, it says that uh, the Lord is merciful, and, uh, and he warned Omer to dream that he should, he should depart out of the land. Right? So he was able to, to leave and uh, and save his life. See, it's uh, you know, it's one of the benefits of being a servant of God that uh, God can tell you things, right? And it's, it can happen in different ways. In this case, it was a dream, right? But sometimes God can speak to you in whatever way, right? And so it's good that we would recognize the voice of God in our life because He tells you things that you would need to know. I mean, here if uh, Omer got up after having that dream and said, oh, that, that was a crazy dream I had, all right, and just uh, you know, blew it off, well, then he would have been killed because he wouldn't have been taken seriously what the Lord was trying to tell him. There's times when God can communicate to us that way. And so here he, he took the communication, took it seriously, and, and he went. Right? So it says he departed the land with family, and, the, and they traveled many days. Now it says they, they passed by the, the hill Shim and the place where the Nephites were destroyed. And this is uh, Moroni telling the story Right, and so uh, Moroni is uh, living in the year 420 A.D., so he's writing this story from you know, 2200 B.C., so of course he knows by that point that this is where the Nephites were destroyed, even though they were destroyed you know, just maybe a few years before he's writing this. So it's almost like he's saying, yeah, they passed by the, 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 this hill, but, yeah, the, same, you know, the same place where the Nephites were destroyed. Of course, that happened many years later, but he knows that because he's, he's living beyond all that. So that's, that's why he's doing it that way. So it's not really... You know, anybody else writing the history of the Jaredites wouldn't throw that in, right? I'm sure, uh, obviously, Ether, when he wrote the original story, didn't put that in because the Nephites hadn't even been born yet. But Moroni knows that, so he inserts that into the story as he's, uh, as he's writing. So, 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 so they moved on, and they, they pitched their tents. And, and then it says, you know, his sons, his daughters, his household, and everybody except Jared and his family. So remember, Jared was one of the sons of Omer. Jared was the one who was, uh, who was trying to be king, and, and I guess it was king. And then his daughter, Jared's daughter, was the one making the whole plot to, to, to kill the kings. So obviously, they were going to bring them along. They were the ones trying to kill them, and they're the ones they're running away from, not, to, not taking with them. And it came to pass that Jared was anointed king over the people by the hand of wickedness, and he gave unto Achish his daughter to wife. And it came to pass that Achish sought the life of his father in law, and he applied unto those whom he had sworn by the oath of the ancients. And they obtained the head of his father-in-law as he sat upon his throne, giving audience to his people. For so great had been the spreading of this wicked and secret society that it had corrupted the hearts of all the people. Therefore Jared was murdered upon his throne, and Achish reigned in his stead. You know, there's a saying that goes like, there's no honor among thieves kind of thing, or right? there's no honor among killers either. Right? So here, uh, th this group... Which uh, again, I keep pointing to the same people because these were the ones involved, all right? It was it was Jared, it was his daughter, and then it says his daughter married Achish, who was the mover and shaker of the whole plot originally, all right? That the uh, goal was to install Jared as the king, which they did, all right? And that's what it says in four. It says Jared was anointed king by the hand of, of, of wickedness, and then he followed through with his part of the agreement, which was to agree that his daughter could marry Achish. So that was Achish's motivation in the first place because he was. Uh, enchanted by the, the daughter, and so he was willing to do anything to, 
you know, kill for her or, or whatever. All right, so he, he gets the he, he gets the girl. All right, but it, it's not enough for him, as you, you can see in verse five. It says uh, Achish sought the life of his father-in-law, which which was Jared. All right, and in fact got back together with the same people and said, hey. It worked once before. Let's let's put the same uh, plot, plot in place again. All right. Let's let's kill the, the, the new king. And now now I can be king. Never mind. I kill for somebody else to be king. I'm gonna kill for myself to be king. And so he arranges the same thing. And in fact, this time they're successful. That they kill Jared. And now now Achish gets to be king. So you see. So it's, as we've said all along, this whole charter building. This is all about you know people who would be king. Uh, the people who were supposed to be king. People who wanted to be king. People who were willing to kill to be the king. So it's all, all about that. And, the, you know, it, so this was the way the story was written that Ether recorded this because this was what captured his attention that uh, throughout their civilization in the different years, that more times than not, the leader wasn't even who the leader should have been because it was all just about you know, getting power and uh, killing and so forth. And then it's like no wonder that the civilization went downhill over time because this is the kind of leadership that they had. So now we have a, now we have a new king, we, now it's King Agish. And it came to pass that Achish began to be jealous of his son. Therefore he shut him up in prison and kept him upon little or no food until he had suffered death. And now the brother of him that suffered death, and his name was Nimrah, was angry with his father because of that which his father had done unto his brother. And it came to pass that Nimrah gathered together a small number of men and fled out of the land and came over and dwelt with Omer. In 7 it says that Achish began to be jealous of his son and put him in prison. See, I would suspect, right, that he was afraid that his son wanted to, was going to want to be king, and then, and then as was just said, maybe he, he was more popular than, than Achish, so that, that's why he was jealous. And, and you know, a lot of times when you do things that are, especially do things that are wrong, you, you assume that others are going to be like you, right? So in other words, Achish was, a, was somebody who was willing to betray his own family members, even kill them to be king, so this is my son. He's probably like me, right? So, so now, now he's going to want to be king, and he's going to want to kill me because I'm assuming that he's, he's like me. Now, it doesn't say anything about the son, so we don't know if he was like him, but you know, it, it certainly would be reasonable that uh, Akish would think so because, like I said, when, when people are evil, they assume that everybody's evil, and then they, they go accordingly. Okay, so that would be why he, was, uh, he felt threatened by him, and, or what says he was jealous, so he says, therefore, he kept him in prison. All right, I'm going to put him in, in jail this way. He, he can't get in any mischief here and uh, didn't even bother to feed him enough so that he, the, the, poor, the poor guy died. All right, so here, his own son, he was willing to let him uh, starve to death rather than take a chance that he might want to, we might have eyes on the throne. All right, so and he also say is, is in eight, one of his other sons, which was one of the, was the brother of the one who, who died, didn't, didn't like that at all. So that's why he said he was angry with his father. So he, so he said, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm not going to hang around for this. Uh, this nastiness. So he, he says he, he took some, uh, you know, some other people, and, and he left. And, and to see where he went, it says he went over to wherever Omer was staying. All right, he went right over and said, oh, "I'm going to go over there and uh, hang out with Omer and his uh, family." That at least, uh, at least they're not going to kill their their own kind here. And it came to pass that Agish begat other sons, and they won the hearts of the people, notwithstanding they had sworn unto him to do all manner of iniquity according to that which he desired. Now the people of Agish were desirous for gain even as Achish was desirous for power. Wherefore, the sons of Achish did offer them money, by which means they drew away the more part of the people after them. And there began to be a war between the sons of Achish and Achish, which lasted for the space of many years, yea, unto the destruction of nearly all the people of the kingdom, yea, even all, save it were thirty souls, and they who fled with the house of Omer. Wherefore, Omer was restored again to the land of his inheritance." So Achish had one son, he, he let him starve to death in prison. He had another son who was angry at that, and so he left and went over to wherever Omer was. Right? But says Achish had other sons too, and as, as these ones, uh, I guess, realized uh, how their father was, it's, uh, they, they weren't too thrilled with him either. Right? But in, in Tennis it says they, they won over some of the people, had them on, on their side, right? and then they were going to basically threaten the, uh, for the kingdom at, at this point. Achish had already obtained promise of, from his sons, those were close to him, that they wouldn't do anything against him, but who cares about that, right? So they said, well, we're not going to be, be uh, bound by that. And uh, in 10, it says, that, uh, or 11, it says, they knew that the people could be motivated by money. You know, it says even as, as Achish was desirous for power, the, the other people were uh, 
hungry for money, so they, they knew how to get the other people on their side. We'll, we'll offer money. All right? So yeah, so the so Akish can have all the power he wants, but we're, we're going to buy the allegiance of all the people, and then they can, uh, the, the, they can all be together to make, uh, make something happen. And that's, that's what they did in, in 12. So they, they had a war. There's a war between the sons of Akish and Akish, all right, which lasted for, for many years. And, you, and you see how, how long it lasted and how devastating it was. Because almost all the people were killed. So if, by the end, there were, there were 30 people left. All right, that doesn't say how many you started with, but by the end, there were 30 people left, not counting the ones who were with Omer. That's why it says there were 30 souls and they who fled to the house of Omer, because Omer's over here somewhere, and there were bales over there. And so they, they killed each other off, killed each other off until there were 30 of them left. And so, as a result, of the, I assume that the, that the king and those who wanted to challenge the king were all dead, so, so he comes over back to, to be the king again, right? So you're, you're right back to where you started from. Okay? So now, and now Omer's king again, all these people are, are, are dead and gone, and, and Omer comes back and is the king of, of uh, 30 people plus, plus uh, whoever went with him. So, I mean, it's not the case all the time that, that I'll say that God cares who, who's king. You know, God's going to intervene, but this was a case where it seemed like Omer just kept popping back up. So it seemed like you know God favored him somewhat. He warned him in a dream to, to go away and not be killed. And then and maybe God saw that, that this was going to happen, that they were all going to all kill each other off. So yeah, you go over there and just hang out over there for a few years and let these people kill, them, kill each other. And then, then you come on back and be the king. And that's what he wound up doing. So. And it came to pass that Omer began to be old. Nevertheless, in his old age, he begat Emer. And he anointed Emer to be king to reign in his stead. And after that he had anointed Emer to be king, he saw peace in the land for the space of two years, and he died, having seen exceeding many days, which were full of sorrow. And it came to pass that Emer did reign in his stead, and did fill the steps of his father. And the Lord began again to take the curse from off the land, and the house of Emer did prosper exceedingly under the reign of Emer, and in the space of sixty and two years they had become exceeding strong, in so much that they became exceeding rich. It says that, that Omer began to be, be old. You know, during his time, it says that you see different ones that had sons, and the sons grew up and became adults and challenged for the, the throne. I mean, even the, the story of Achish, Achish started out marrying the daughter of Jared, and then by the time Omer came back, he already had the, you know, multiple sons who had grown up, had died, and were, were soldiers. So, yeah, so time had passed. So Omer, I'm sure, was pretty old. I doesn't say how old. It says he began to be old, and so... And now he's figured. Now that the kingdom is back the way it should be, now I can actually pick who the next king is going to be. And so he picks his son, uh, Emer, to, to be the next king. And so he gets the right Emer over here, and, and, and he goes in this line, right? Because he's in the, so happily he's the son of Omer. So after that, he says he you know, he lived for, for two more years. At least he got to see the beginning of the of a peaceful part of the kingdom. It says you know that he died, and uh, so his son Emer was was the king. And uh, so, so there was a period of time when really there was a peaceful time now. So 62 years go by with, with no wars or problems or so forth. So apparently Emer's uh, reign was a good, a good period of time for the Jaredites. Well, a rare one, right? Because for the whole time we've been reading, it's always fighting over the throne and so forth. But now it says Emer gets to be the king during a peaceful time. It says and that people become exceeding strong, become exceeding rich, right? And the next verses we're going to really kind of say what that means as far as them being exceeding rich. Having all manner of fruit, and of grain, and of silks, and of fine linen, and of gold, and of silver, and of precious things, and also all manner of cattle, of oxen, and cows, and of sheep, and of swine, and of goats, and also many other kinds of animals, which were useful for the food of man. And they also had horses, and asses, and there were elephants, and kirlams, and kumams, all of which were useful unto man, and more especially the elephants, and kirlams, and kumams. And thus the Lord did pour out his blessings upon this land, which was choice above all other lands. And he commanded that whoso should possess the land, should possess it unto the Lord, or they should be destroyed when they were ripened in iniquity. For upon such, saith the Lord, I will pour out the fullness of my wrath. All right, so you see in these verses kind of uh, some detail of uh, what it meant that they were exceeding rich. At this time, this is, you know, a manner of fruit, rain, silks, fine linens, gold, silver, precious things. Okay, it talks about the different animals that they, that they had. It, notice the, uh, the variety of, uh, of animals. Right? It says you know, cattle, ox, cows, sheep, goats, swine, uh, horses, elephants, etc. All right, so there's lots of uh, different, uh, different animals that they had. And, and you know what I was thinking is uh, we're reading this list. Um, 
how did those uh, animals get there? If you remember uh, when it talked about uh, the, uh, loading up the barges, right, that it included some, some animals, that they, they brought animals with them, so apparently it was enough animals to, to trigger the, the, these animals, all right? And, I mean, although when I think of an elephant, all right, so I mean, so it must have been a baby elephant, all right? It would be tough for me to picture a full-grown elephant in the, in, in the barge, right? That would be a little, little much, all right? So it must have been something smaller that, that, that they were able to breed. Or, or again, or as you suggest, maybe something that they called an elephant wasn't, it didn't look exactly the way we see the elephant today. Yeah, you know, when you think of, the, of the, these the kurloms and kumoms, all right, that we, you know, know what they are. So right, so it could either be an animal that was in existence then, that's extinct now, right? Or it could be some other animal that, that we call something different today. I mean, it would be another possibility. But yeah, what, exactly what these animals are, we, we don't know because we're not familiar with the word. We don't, there's nothing else written anywhere that uses these words. So uh, it's just an interesting point there that they mention these as animals, even though they're animals that we're not familiar with. All right, but, uh, which was, but these are all the different animals that they, that they had by then. And so, yeah, this was a, a way of being wealthy or rich that they had all these animals in their possession. So in summary there, and so in 20, he's just saying yeah, the Lord is pouring out his blessings upon the land in all these ways that we're talking about in terms of what they had, what they ate, the animals that they owned. Right? These were all things that showed uh, how God was blessing them. Right? And, and so the, the idea was that, you know, that God would bless people on this land if they were serving him, which has always been the way it's been said in the, in the Book of Mormon. Right? Down through the, the Nephites also, is that if you serve me, you're, you're blessed. If you're not, then you have a problem. Right? And that's why it says here that it's, it says that whoso should possess the land would possess it unto the Lord, or they would be destroyed when they're ripened in iniquity, right? In, in, in which time I'll pour out the fullness of my wrath upon them, right? So it was the same for them, that they were going to live on this land. God wanted them to serve him. And we just saw what happened to the, to the people who were doing all the plotting and the killing and so forth, that they were basically wiped out, and that the kingdom was restored to the righteous king. So, so God was following through on what he was saying right here. And Emer did execute judgment and righteousness all his days, and he begat many sons and daughters, and he begat Coriantum, and he anointed Coriantum to reign in his stead. And after he had anointed Coriantum to reign in his stead, he lived four years, and he saw peace in the land, yea, and he even saw the son of righteousness, and did rejoice and glory in his day, and he died in peace. And it came to pass that Coriantum did walk in the steps of his father, and did build many mighty cities, and did administer that which was good unto his people in all his days. And it came to pass that he had no children, even until he was exceeding old. And it came to pass that his wife died, being a hundred and two years old. And it came to pass that Coriantum took to wife in his old age a young maid, and begat sons and daughters, wherefore he lived until he was a hundred and forty and two years old. We've been reading about the, uh, the reign of Emer, right? It says he, he mentioned that he went sixty-two years, uh, and there was peace in the land. And uh, now in 21, it says he was a, a righteous king uh, all his days. He, he had lots of children. And in particular, mentions Coriantum, who was now going to be the, the next king. All right, so we should add his name to the list here. And we go down here. Okay, so that's the next uh, king in the, the natural line of kings there. And you notice, just like with uh, Omer and Emer, they, they did a little bit of overlap, right? Like it said that Omer picked Emer to be the king and then lived two more years, so this way he was able to, I guess, you know, transition, and it wasn't that he was going to stay king until the day he died, but his son was able to pick up and begin, and now he did the same thing here. It says in 22, it says after he had anointed Coriantum to reign in his stead, he, which is Emer, lived four years and, and saw peace in the land. It says, even saw the son of righteousness. Now, to be Jesus, right? And uh, if you remember a few chapters ago, we read how the, the brother Jared saw Jesus, all right? So, you know, the, the Jesus appeared to him. Remember when he touched the, the stones and made them light up, right? So, it, it was not out of the question that the Lord could appear. And so, that's what it sounds like happened here as well. That uh, it says, it says, Emer saw the, the son of righteousness, all right? And, uh, so, that, uh, you know, he did have a, an experience or something where he witnessed the, the Lord. It says, and then did rejoice in glory in his day, and he died in peace, all right? So that tells you that this was a righteous man who had faith. See, there's not, not a lot written about him, just these few verses, but, you know, for, for the Lord to appear to him, obviously, he must have had faith and been a righteous, uh, righteous person. Because the brother Jared was the only other one we heard about that uh, the same thing happened. All right, so that was, this, so that was Emer, all right? Now, in, in 23, it's been turned over to Coriantum. 
So it's easy to walk in the steps of his father, build, build cities, right? And, and now it, you, know, you get your biographical part of this where uh, it says he grew to be old with no children. And the, you, know, you, would, you would wonder whether it was you know, maybe his wife was not able to have children because it says his wife lived to be 102 and then she died. And, and now he, he being uh, uh, some old guy of 100 or, or, or so married a young girl, his, his new wife now it says uh, was able to have children. Right, it says that he took a wife in his old age and a young maiden, and she begat sons and daughters. Right, and so then and he lived to be 142 years old. So I guess he lived long enough for his children to grow up, and he was able to see them grow up, and he lived to a ripe old age of 142. And it came to pass that he begat Com, and Com reigned in his stead, and he reigned 40 and nine years, and he begat Heth, and he also begat other sons and daughters. And the people had spread again over all the face of the land. And there began again to be an exceeding great wickedness upon the face of the land. And Heth began to embrace the secret plans again of old to destroy his father. And it came to pass that he did dethrone his father, for he slew him with his own sword, and he did reign in his stead. So we've had lots of peace uh, so far, right? But you can see that that's going to change here in a, in a couple of kings. And uh, so in 25, it says that Coriantum lived to be 142 years old. Now it has turned the kingdom over to, to his son, Calm. So we're going to put Calm up on the board. Okay, and uh, it says that Calm reigned 49 years, and, and he has a son named Heth, all right, and, uh, as well as other sons and daughters. Right, and uh, so as as the people are growing now, and a lot of years are passing. See, from the time that there was only thirty, right? I mean, we've already seen sixty-two years pass for one king, of you know, forty-nine for another. So you know, over a hundred years have have passed at this point. In fact, uh, you know, Coriantum, who was born after that, lived to be one hundred forty-two. So you know, so a lot of years are passing here, and so the, the number of people are growing uh, significantly. Right, that's why it says the people spread again over all the face of the land. They have repopulated to replace all the people who were killed when they had that, that war, right? And, and so, unfortunately, it's also going to go back to the way of the, the son trying to take over from the father. And it says in 26, the son, Heth, says, begins to embrace the secret plans to destroy his father. In 27, it says he's able to do that. He, he kills his father with his own sword and takes over as, as the king, right? So, so now, now we write Heth over here. So Heth, the, the son of Kam, kills him and takes over as the king in an evil way, and so now he's, he's reigning as, as the king over there. And there came prophets in the land again, crying repentance unto them, that they must prepare the way of the Lord, or there should come a curse upon the face of the land. Yea, even there should be a great famine, in which they should be destroyed if they did not repent. But the people believed not the words of the prophets, but they cast them out, and some of them they cast into pits, and left them to perish. And it came to pass that they did all these things according to the commandment of the king, Heth. You can tell when things are becoming evil because God sends prophets to, to speak to the people. All right? He sends uh, men of God uh, there, you know, perhaps from, again from their own kingdom. All right? but these were uh, people sent then to tell the king that he was doing wrong, which not that it should have been any information to him because he knew he killed his father, so he knew that that wasn't really the right thing to do, but he wanted to be king, so he, so he did it anyway. So it says, uh, in 28, says, the prophets came to the land again, crying repentance, prepare the way of the Lord, or else there's going to be a curse upon the land, or he says, or, or even a, a, a great famine, right, in which the people are going to be destroyed unless they repent. So he's saying, you know, the, God is not happy with this arrangement, and he's ready to uh, cause a famine to come upon the land, to show people that they should be repenting instead of living the way that they're living and maybe following the example of the evil king. And so in 29, it says the people believe not the words of the prophets, all right? It says, you know, cast them out, cast them in pits, and left them to perish, all right? And it says that the, at the urging of the king, it says the king said, don't, don't listen to them and, uh, you know, kill them, cast them out, put them in prison, whatever, all right? But uh, we're fine. We don't have to listen to what the prophets are saying. They don't know what they're talking about. And it came to pass that there began to be a great dearth upon the land, and the inhabitants began to be destroyed exceeding fast because of the dearth, for there was no rain upon the face of the earth. And there came forth poisonous serpents also upon the face of the land, and did poison many people. And it came to pass that their flocks began to flee before the poisonous serpents towards the land southward, which was called by the Nephites Zarahemla. And it came to pass that there were many of them which did perish by the way, 
Nevertheless, there were some which fled into the land southward. Right, so in response to uh, when they treated the prophets, this is a, that God responded by sending what is called a great dearth upon the land. A great dearth would be some kind of a drought, right? Because as you see in the second half of the verse, it says the inhabitants began to be destroyed exceedingly fast, but there was no rain upon the face of the earth. Right? So a period of time went by with, with no rain, and you know, as we know, you have a drought, especially a serious drought, you have a problem. Right? And the, so I, you know, I don't know how they were set for having stored up any, any water or anything, so they were, they were hurting, and says as people were, uh, began to be destroyed very, very fast, all right? as there was no water on the land. And as we know, you can only live so long without, without water. I mean, you know, food, you can maybe go a little bit of time, but you don't have water for a very short period of time, and you, you can't survive. So that's what it said, they, they began to die very fast. And then just as a bonus, in 31, some poisonous serpents too. Poisonous serpents upon the face of the land that poisoned the, the people, all right? And so now it says the people uh, began to want to leave this area, right? Kind of get away from this area that's got all these uh, snakes around, which I can't say I blame them, right? And so it says they were traveling to another land, which once again, Moroni notes, the, the land that, that today was called Zarahemla, that's, that's where they, they were going. All right, so they, they headed there, so, you know, so, so some went to the, the land southward. Basically, they, they left that area, right, because there's, there's no rain, there's no water, there, there's poisonous snakes. This doesn't seem like a very good place to live, right? So they were leaving there to go find someplace else. But, of course, you can't flee from God, all right? If you're not serving God and, and God wants to do whatever, right, he, the, where can you hide, right? You can't hide from God. you just got to really do what's right or else God will find you wherever you are and... Uh, whatever he needs to do to you to get your attention. And it came to pass that the Lord did cause the serpents that they should pursue them no more, but that they should hedge up the way that the people could not pass, that whoso should attempt to pass might fall by the poisonous serpents. And it came to pass that the people did follow the course of the beasts and did devour the carcasses of them which fell by the way until they had devoured them all. Now when the people saw that they must perish, they began to repent of their iniquities and cry unto the Lord. And it came to pass that when they had humbled themselves sufficiently before the Lord, he did send rain upon the face of the earth, and the people began to revive again, and there began to be fruit in the north countries, and in all the countries round about. And the Lord did show forth his power unto them in preserving them from famine. They were leaving the area because they were fleeing from the poisonous serpents. Right, so the, now the, says the Lord had sent the, the poison serpents, so He didn't necessarily send them to follow them. All right, but but yet, you know, as, as they went, it says they, they had to basically try to survive by eating the like the, the dead animals that were there who had been, uh, I guess, bitten by the, the poisonous snakes. So it says that they were they were eating those and, and trying to survive on that, but eventually that was all gone. All right, so when finally all other avenues were exhausted, right. They, they weren't, uh, they were short on stuff to drink, they were, they were eating just dead animals, now they, that's gone, and now, now finally they did what they should have done in the first place, yeah. right? That's all, that's all God was trying to do, was get their attention, uh, that they would repent of, of their sins, and then seek to do what God wanted them to do. So finally, it says in 35, or at the end of 34, it says, when the people saw they must perish, then they began to repent of their iniquities and cry unto the Lord. I mean, it's a shame that you have to be beaten up that much to, to get... Uh, your attention, that they got to get your attention, but, you know, re really, if they were able to repent and be back in God's good graces, they should be grateful that, that God spared them and did it that way instead of just killing them all, right? So that they, they have the chance now in 35, says that, that they humble themselves and su sufficiently if uh, the Lord now lifted all, all the curse off the land. Mm -hmm. So they returned the, the rain and then fruit and so forth, and then they were able to revive and... Uh, and, and reestablish their, their community and their kingdom, right? So you know, God wanted them to repent of their sins. God wanted them to do what right they did. You know, like the way, the way Heth was leading this, this kingdom, right? So that uh, he wanted to get the people's attention, get them to repent, send the prophets, they wouldn't listen. Finally, it, it took a, a drought and poisonous snakes, and finally he got their attention as they humbled themselves officially, they repented, and now God was able to lift the curse and revive the land of the people.